I want to introduce Wolfgang Blau. He's the president of Condé Nast International. Wolfgang. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Wolfgang, I was reading the New York Times uh, and I opened up the paper and all of a sudden there was a, a photo of someone I recognized and it was you, a very large photo of you. You had a very nice profile in there and it talked about the revolution at Condé Nast International. Is that one an accurate statement? Well, you know that I find, so hello everyone, first of all, but that you can edit this, I'll start the sentence over. Um, <laughs> I'm skeptical when I hear the word revolution in the context of, of changes in the media because revolution, transformation, disruption are all words that promise some sort of endpoint of change. As if there is order, then there is chaos, and then there will be order again. So I usually never use the word revolution internally. But yes, some of the changes we have made are big changes and, and might feel as tumultuous as revolutions. So I, I understand why they picked that headline. Okay, give me the top three changes. Because there have been many, and then we're going to talk about Condé Nast over, overall, which is going through its own uh, revolution, if you will. I'd say three or four years ago, we organized ourselves primarily around countries and nation states. And countries are hugely important and always will be as, as cultural points of reference, as, as anchors of reference for identity and all that. So we're not disbanding countries. But it was the primary mode of operation. And within country, it was by brand. And within brand, it was by platform print, digital, and then the different digital channels. Uh, and we've shifted towards an operational model of seeing ourselves organized around brands. Huge difference. Requires a much greater degree of coordination, collaboration, and also shared agreement of what the brand stands for. Just the last two days, we had all GQ editors from around the world and GQ publishers here in the building to discuss that very question of what does brand GQ stand for and, and also how are concepts of masculinity and virility changing differently in different parts of the world. We didn't need to have these conversations three, four years ago because these different teams didn't have much to do with each other and the overlap of audiences on Instagram also was not as dramatic. Um, so that's change number one. Change number two is also, and that was hard, is Jonathan Newhouse usually, you know, it's a family-owned company, as you know, and Jonathan Newhouse says in the past, we looked at every brand like children. You want to give every child the same education, the same resource, the same musical instrument lessons and all that. But in, in this day and age, and at this degree of competition, we had to prioritize brands. We had to sequence investments. And, and, and as you know from your own world at DigiDay, I think a strategy is only worth that word if it contains a, a, a difficult element of prioritization and of deciding what not to do and possibly never to do versus just having these endless bucket lists. And that's how we arrived at this principle of Vogue first, which was really new and difficult for the other brands and teams to accept initially. Okay, let me just go for those two. The first one, although you didn't use the word, it sounded like centralization. Media companies typically go through periods where they, they centralize, and then they disperse, and then they centralize. Um, Condé Nast is coming at this from a particular context. Um, it would seem that centralizing is being driven by exogenous forces in digital media, but that it runs counter to how Condé Nast was set up. So it's a business challenge. It's a technology challenge. I, I know Condé Nast had, had many, many CMSs. Um, you probably found some that you didn't know you had. It, it, but then it's an internal cultural challenge. If you compare us with, with the typical set of digital or digital-only publishers from the US, they try to internationalize as fast as they can um, and build credibility and cultural currency in the countries they set up shop. And we almost came from the other end. We already are in, in including all our partnerships, 27 countries. We just never looked at ourselves as a global company, but more as a network of highly autonomous regional companies. So our internationalization is almost a reverse engineered process, but also wonderful because we, all, we only have to connect the dots. To give you an example, we only now really let it sink in that globally, uh, all our evokes together employ about 800 editorial staff. We never had a reason to count that. 
right? But now as we look into what else we can do and, and, and how we can tap into that as a network of analysts, as advisors, as informants for new editorial services and, 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 and commercial services, we suddenly realize that we are the largest player in that space globally. So, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, when you say uh, external forces, uh, our centralization is not driven by cost cutting. Neither is our integration with our American sister company, despite what the press wrote. Um, across our 11 wholly owned markets of Condé Nast International, um, and it was, of course, terribly difficult, especially for those affected by these cuts, but we reduced staff between 2015 and early 2018, um, I'd say by about 30%. Um, and since then, we have added another 300 staff again globally and have now grown to something like 3,600 staff. In different areas. In different areas, and, 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 but a lot, of course, in technology, in digital editorial staff, digital sales staff, analysts, data teams that didn't exist before. Uh, so now we're roughly at 3,600 staff, and we invest, the Newhouse family, our parent company, Advance, invests about 100 million per year into the modernization. Of, of our CNI companies worldwide. That's not even including what we're investing in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the motive is not cost cutting, the motive is something else. Is we are, we of course have, have modernized and are in the process of modernizing <coughs> all our middle office and back office. So CMSs as an example, which I know this might sound crazy, but that's where we came from. Our uh, 23, Vogue's globally currently sit on, now we have migrated, but a year ago set on 22 different content management systems. Okay, that's right? crazy. So, and of course there's a version of that that goes into sales systems and, and mm -hmm. pretty much every system. So of course, everything that you could describe as middle office and back office, when in doubt, we centralize it. Not always in London or New York, but we need to centralize it. And not necessarily in the interest of cost cutting, but in the interest of greater agility and, and, and innovation that you can afford to do then. Um, and and the, the, the motivation for integrating with the US is very similar to the motivation for building a stronger headquarter for the international operating company, which is that Everything that's new, all these new services, investments into colleges in different ways, not just country by country, new influencer agencies we're building currently in eight different markets, uh, requires prioritization. And sometimes to say, we're not going to do it here, but we're going to do it here. And, and both our American colleagues and us here realized we need some sort of a governance structure that can say yes, no. And as we all try to be as collaborative as we can, we sometimes landed smack in the middle making compromises that are not yeah. good for the business. But the contexts are very different from the US versus international. And, and I think you probably had a lot of advantages of having that separation. How do you make sure that you don't give up those advantages of seeing markets differently? Because I know I've, I've heard people in the US can look at things outside the US and, and, and paint them all with the same brush. I think that the, the, the fantastic opportunity in the US, of course, is the scale. You can play a scale game in the US and you have the highest ad spend per capita digitally in the world to this day. So that's fantastic. The, the challenge, of course, is that scale now means something completely different than it meant three or four years ago. We're in this post-scale digital publishing economy. Uh, and that leads you to different answers in a country the size of the US and also the size of China, our other market, than it does, let's say, in Italy or Japan. So many of our Vogue's and other titles, GQ, AD, what have you, um, in countries like, like Italy or Japan, always had a stronger B2B angle to them, um, with, with often much smaller market shares or, or circulations than you would assume, but outsized influence. And that suddenly in this new economy where brand becomes so much more important than scale, and, and many of us in different ways, just like you are with your publication, shifting towards B2B and that whole ecosystem of conferences and consulting mm -hmm. and everything you can build around that, uh, many of our smaller markets are just in a luckier position to do that now. So the, the second thing you mentioned was basically picking winners in some way by, by mm. being Vogue first and GQ first. That must be a tough message if you're not at Vogue or GQ. 
It is. And that's why I didn't want to give interviews for so long. It's literally the reason where I thought uh, every minute I give an interview, uh, I, I could spend time with teams in countries and traveled more than is healthy for me and for uh, this planet. Um, and, and spend time to explain that, that this is not a decision against the other brands, but that many of the investments that are now arriving at the other brands, we could never have unlocked if we would have said we want to do everything at once. And still, we're, we know we're migrating 59 websites in 11 countries across eight languages within roughly 20 months. No one has ever done that. But, but we had to start with Vogue. Uh -huh. And, and, and the mechanics behind it, I think, are becoming more clear in how we prioritize brands. You know, you can look at, of course, you look at existing revenue, but existing revenue is a dangerous metric because you might miss the biggest future opportunity. You look at existing margins. Um, but we've put all those aside, and we just said the internet favors niche brands that are clearly defined, where the brand name already evokes a topical association. So if you hear Vogue, you know you're about to interact with fashion, commercially or editorially. Um, that's not true for all of our brands. Some of our brands, you know, uh, you can expect fantastic journalism, well-written, well-edited, uh, outrageously qualified writers, but you don't know the topic. And in the mechanics of the web, uh, how, how search clusters are being built and link ecosystems, that's a challenge. Uh, the second bit is uh, visual brands that are very visually driven. Vogue is very visually driven, uh, caters to social, caters to video. Um, the third bit is that the subject matter that Vogue covers itself, fashion, has a global layer, uh, a, re a national layer, a regional layer, and in the large you know, mega cities, even hyper-local layers of different street styles in different parts of a city. Um, and, and the fact that there is a global layer, i.e. the stories every Vogue wants to have, the big fashion shows, the big supermodel stories and all that, the big trade stories, um, that there are synergies where we can support all Vogue centrally. That's not true for every brand. We can support every brand centrally, editorially. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, brand, in, initially, of course, when you say we're going to launch a central content desk, uh, as a local team, just as I would have responded as a local editor, I would have said, oh my god, that's the beginning of the end, right? Here comes well, the, it's a tough sell, here right? Comes the I mean, what's, desk. what's unique about Vogue is that you go to the U.S. Vogue. I mean, my, I, I hate to do the my wife thing, but like, you know, my wife has her list of different Vogues she likes. It's like Vogue Japan is number one, and then you know, there's the British Vogue, American Vogue is the last one. So, um, but um, that's what makes Vogue unique is that it's different in all these different markets. And when you start to centralize, obviously there's a risk that you just make you know, the same thing in, in, in the name of efficiency. If I was a local Vogue chief editor or architectural digest, glamour, wired, vanity fair, traveler, and, and I would hear that headquarters is launching a central content desk, I would think that's the beginning of the end, isn't it? Because first they will prove that a centrally produced content desk can function, that the content can sufficiently resonate around the world, and next thing they would cut my local budget. So we knew that was the fear um, but the starting point also was that, that we felt that we had not invested enough in each market and that it made no sense to now just dramatically increase digital editorial staff in all countries without also centrally creating structures for and teams for knowledge sharing, for training specialists for the different social platforms and all that. And it just took these two years of building trust and by now uh, our teams around the world see um, a, they have built personal relationships with the Vogue International team here. Uh, the mutual respect has been built. And they also saw that we increased the, the digital editorial staff in each country globally by 50%, mm -hmm. while at the same time, we have hired more editors into the markets than centrally. Centrally, it's about 60 staff. Right. I mean, you're hiring an editor-in-chief for Vogue International. I think I that am. itself, wouldn't an editor-in-chief at a local Vogue look at that as a recipe for disaster because they're going to lose power? I'm sure some did initially. Um, but I think we have said it many times and confirm it also through action and budget discussions every year that the power of these brands rests on Vogue Japan being as Japanese as can be, uh, Vogue Italy as Italian as can be, Vogue American as American as can be. 
Uh, that is the power of these brands. If, if, you, if you start syndicating too much content, and you'd be surprised how little content we syndicate across markets, they would lose that. The, the power of our brands compared to the, the new brands that have come along is that in many countries, readers think that brand only exists in their country. I would, I would bet a good dinner with an expensive wine that uh, a sizable share of Vogue Paris thinks the brand started in France. And that's great. We want that myth to exist. Mm -hmm. and, and you can really damage that if you, if you start l flattening the earth. Also, the world has changed just in the four years I'm here now. I find that there are two counter trends happening in parallel. One is that the playing field of the tools we are using, of the metrics we are using, of the language we are speaking and the terminology is all becoming the same globally. Even in the, in the WeChat countries or in Japan where the Line app is most dominant. But cultures have become even more differentiated and trends also have become more differentiated. Um, so it would now be even more dangerous than three or four years ago. And I don't, I don't mean it negatively. Yes, there's the phenomenon of, of neo-nationalism in some countries. But also regional cultures, cultures are so much stronger thanks to social media of people finding each other that it would really be the wrong yeah. thing. And I think our editors see that by now. Yeah. So how is the business model need, needed to change? And it is different in each market. Print is still very strong in many markets. Um, digital is stronger in other markets. Um, but how do you see, what are the, the top business um, model challenges that you see? We have a really intriguing challenge. And let me briefly talk about my last role in a newspaper company. If you work for a daily newspaper, the working assumption is that print will disappear. right? And the question is, how much time do you have to use that revenue to build the new world? And here it's different, is, is we don't see any reason. and and. Believe me, if I'm, if I'm scared of, of one thing, it's complacency of media managers. But, but I have been looking at this now with our teams for many years. We do not see a reason why there shouldn't be a Vogue magazine in 20 years from now. Its editorial concept will have changed dramatically by then. Its frequency might change. It certainly will be more expensive, the copy price, than it is now. But people are not walking away from print. They're walking away from editorial concepts that have lost their function next to other new digital services, mm -hmm. while Vogue being highly visual is not in that situation. Yeah. So what that means is that you need managers and executives and strategists, analysts, editors who love print, who think about print, who want to reinvent print, while at the same time these executives also need to think about what it means to build new businesses around these brands. Uh, and we are now at the point where, where we are even challenging the notion that you know, you still hear this saying, the magazine is the anchor of the brand. The magazine is the manifestation of the brand. We no longer think that. The magazine is hugely important. It is a hugely important voice. But if the magazine was the, the purest and cleanest manifestation of a brand, the majority of our people that interact with that will never touch that magazine, mm -hmm. right? They go to conferences or colleges or other things. So let's talk briefly about you know expanding the brand and 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 bringing it into new uh, places, whether it's Vogue cafes yeah. or whether it's the fashion colleges, because there's a lot of opportunity there. The Vogue brand means a lot, but at the same time, you clearly do not want to go down the route of like other publishers that are sort of taking what were once storied brands and are are putting it on like Manila shopping centers and oh, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, Jonathan Newhouse, our, our chairman and CEO, who has really built this, this, this global miracle of Condé Nast International, has been extremely conservative when it came to experiments with the brand. So he, 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 he was really careful about Vogue branded restaurants or cafes or, you know, as you can imagine, there are so many textile companies that want to do Vogue t-shirts and GQ hoodies where we always said, and, and often these are very, very compelling offers, and we said no, because we, we, you lose that brand authority so quickly. So yes, we're very, very careful, but we have built a team now and have also integrated the American team and the international team, because most of these partnerships, if, if you speak with automotive companies or hotel chains or whatever it is, these days are, are global conversations. Really? You're, you're seeing that? Because I mean, a lot of times there's not as many global deals as people think there are, and, and that st stuff still takes place on, on the national level. 
Well, we had, um, for instance, a, a beverage company we worked with in the past, and it was very successful. And when in that country we wanted to continue that conversation, the answer was fantastic, but we really need to speak globally at this point. So the, the interesting deals are global, also because of how cars or other products are being sold globally. It's mm -hmm. just too complicated for them to produce something only for one continent or one market. So one thing in the US, the, the, the conversation has shifted to, I mean, we shift from thing to thing. It's like a yeah. children's soccer game or football game. Um, everyone just follows the ball around. Uh, but the conversation has shifted quite a bit to getting people to pay for digital content. And Condé Nast is, is doing that, um, doing it with Vanity Fair, doing it with The New Yorker, doing it with Wired. I might be missing one or two. Um, doesn't seem as much of a priority with CNI. Not yet. We have run experiments with paywalls in India. And that's, that's the beauty of having so many markets and so many titles that you can, can experiment um, and, and learn from each other. But um, I think paywalls need scale. You know, you need, you need, A, you need a huge amount of high quality content, uh, and you need a, a potentially huge audience because as soon as you have a paywall, you need to frustrate mostly your loyalists before they hopefully sign up to the paywall. Yes. Um, so this I is think where I, I put in a, a plug for Digiday Plus, our <laughs> membership program. <laughs> we'll Great. annoy you until Great. you subscribe. Uh, but you well, had so. me at this is where. Um, <laughs> Once we have migrated all our sites on the same platform, we are in a place where we can run these experiments centrally, and of course we'll test various forms of hybrid paywalls. But we are, are very optimistic about the businesses we build around these publications, whether it's colleges, whether it's more and more conferences. We already have a huge conference business in many markets of different types, B2C and B2B, where we don't really want to um, impede on our audience that way. How much of your business is what you would consider B2B versus B2C for CNI? Because, I mean, it's different. Like, yeah. in scale markets like the United States, it's different than, than in, in smaller markets. It's, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that. It's really difficult because the, 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 the borders are really blurry between B2B and B2C. Yeah. Uh, I'd say most of our conferences, for instance, are B2B. Mm -hmm. Um, most of our current thinking more goes towards B2B. Most of our editorial products, if not all, are, are B2C, or at least are being sold as B2C, while we know the Vogue's have a high share of B2B readers. Uh, and in print, it's learned behavior to know which story is B2B and B2C. Digitally, we want to untangle that a little bit over the course of this year. OK, I want to open up to questions, but I have two more things. One, I'm a voracious reader of your tweets. Oh, really? So I'm going to, I, I went back in your tweets and I want you to explain one. Would you, would you like me to leave? <laughs> Are you ready? Um, you said, in publishing, legacy cultures are usually associated um, with print or broadcasts, but I believe that in digital they are more likely to transform. What did you mean by that? Legacy cultures and digital we usually think about when we say legacy, it's usually a shorthand for for print businesses or TV businesses. Yeah, when you go to industry conferences, someone inevitably will complain about cultural issues and legacy cultures. And it's understood that that must have to do with the broadcast arm of the organization or the print arm. Um, and, you know, now so many decades in digital publishing, of course, you you have the same issues on the digital side. Just as an example with video, as it started with YouTube, there was a different production style. Then everybody shifted to Facebook. You needed a completely different type of production. Uh, first 30 seconds needed to contain the best material. The YouTube type documentary filmers hated that idea of giving everything away. You had to restaff. Uh, then it shifted to Instagram. Then it shifts to vertical. And, and you, in, you, you, you try to retrain as much as you can, but you end up rehiring. So you have a much faster cycle of retraining and rehiring on the digital side than you have on the print side. OK, so it's not like the, the people are more, quote unquote, legacy minded. It's just that the rapidity of change means that you can only adapt so much as a person. Yeah, and I think there's a second dimension to that, that often in, in, in established publishing companies, the digital teams, at least on the editorial side, in that newsroom hierarchy were on the lower rungs. And that can lead to a wagon fortress mentality 
um, that, that almost is a bit like cultural jet lag where teams sometimes don't understand that, that these days are over. Uh, and, and that identity then is tied to workflows and processes sometimes more strongly than on the print side. So the other thing, this also came from your tweets. I usually get most of my Brexit news from, from your tweets. Um, but now you've pivoted. You've pivoted to climate change. Oh. And um, what I'm interested in, though, is to tie back to a brand like Vogue. What is the responsibility of a brand like Vogue, which is built on the, the, the consumerism and the consumption, and the fashion industry does not have a great track record as far as sustainability, what is the responsibility of Vogue to highlight these kind of issues and to push for a more sustainable future when it comes to the fashion industry? I think it's huge. It's a huge responsibility. Um, and we all, many of you have seen these reports that the textile industry, not necessarily the fashion or high fashion, but textile industry is one of the, depending on how you count it, top three, top five causes of, of, of CO2 emissions. So the textile industry has a huge role to play. And we also see that fast fashion uh, now is down to life cycles of a t-shirt being designed to that same shirt showing up in a landfill, sometimes not even being washed anymore. Worn once because it's so cheap. Worn once because someone doesn't want to show up on Instagram with the same t-shirt twice. Um, that is a conversation that is hugely important. Um, Many of our Vogues have touched upon the issue or cover it. Vogue Australia has a dedicated sustainability editor. On the publishing side, Condinas Spain has been a pioneer, and they went carbon neutral 10 years ago. Brazil, uh, I think since last year, in their production is carbon neutral. But I feel that Vogue, you know, first and foremost is a fashion publication, but sits at two fault lines of global cultural and political earthquakes. One is the conversation about climate change, and the other one is about um, the relationship between women and men uh, and, and, and how we, men and women, treat women in society. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when I look at, at these new populists, I don't want to mention names, we all know their names, I find it interesting how many of them comment about how women should behave and how they should dress. Uh, and I didn't mm -hmm. see that when I joined Korn and Ast, that, that fashion is so much a vehicle of individual expression, and that individual expression is being seen as dangerous by these people. Um, so Vogue is not a political publication, mm -hmm. but, but what surprised me and what I had to learn all, only over time is the power of these brands yeah. to shape societal conversations. But what's interesting, as we've seen, is a lot mm -hmm. of media brands are struggling with not being political um, publications, because Pretty much, um, you know, here, like in the U.S., it's all politics all the time. Um, you know, Trump attacks, uh, you know, f NFL football players, and then all of a sudden ESPN has to wade into these kind of political issues. Um, it's interesting to see how publications actually draw the line of, of responding to their audience without getting, getting sucked into being political content. Yeah, we, we don't want to enter daily politics, but we certainly want to inspire uh, designers. We want to promote labels that try new ways of production, new materials. Um, and, and we also hear that from our clients. I just met with the, the chief sustainability officer of one of the world's largest luxury consortiums. And it was just fantastically interesting. Uh, and, and she also said, we are waiting for you. We're mm -hmm. waiting for you to make your voice heard, you, the Vogue's around this world. And the same applies to something like Architectural Digest. You know, we just gathered many of our Architectural Digest editors and they spoke about the chemical footprint of paints and fabrics and uh, granite counters. And, and there are so many issues. We cover, our brands cover the four basic human needs, you could say, tools, shelter, food, clothes, and how to ennoble them. And so we find ourselves now in the middle of a global conversation about how to redo, rethink, re-engineer, re-celebrate all four of them. OK, so we can either get to my list of questions about programmatic advertising, or we can open it up to questions. <laughs> no, I, one, which... one last thing. I, I dodged your question about the biggest challenges, and I don't want to do that. OK. Um, You've had time to think. I, I, yes. Um, <laughs> then programmatic you, advertising. While, while you were reading my tweets. Um, 
biggest challenge is finding the right balance between local and global. And that is a pendulum that swings. And we try to, to have the swings you know, smaller in, what is it, amplitude. Um, and the other one is speed, is, is to, to, to constantly figure out, is it too much change or is it too little change? And when in doubt, we say, if we, as long as we don't change faster than the ground underneath our feet is changing, we're probably fine. But sometimes we get it wrong, and it's too much. I find those the two biggest challenges. So sometimes it's too fast, because there, there was a time yeah. when everyone said, oh, you got to move fast, got to oh, move no. fast. And then like everyone looked at Facebook, and they moved very fast. Um, but it they broke too, too much. It can be too fast. If you, if, you, if, you, if you unhinge every single area of the business, from procurement to finance to training to HR policies to editorial to sales procedures, there, there comes a point where someone calls you and says, are you out of your mind? Do you want me to run a business or work for you? OK. I want to open up to questions. If, and if you don't ask a question, we're going to go into the programmatic advertising. <laughs> so I think there is a microphone. Yeah? yeah? I don't know if there is. Is there? Anyone okay. has a question? Oh, no, Wolfgang, we might have to s talk about supply path optimization. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that got it. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, at a time when Condé Nast itself has shut some of its Snapchat channel brands. It looks like CNI is continuing to grow different language editions. Do you still see a lot of potential in Snapchat as a platform? I do, um, but it has shifted. So obviously Snapchat is, is, is struggling with selling, and I think that has primarily to do with the fact that still most uh, marketing staff they speak with in companies don't use Snapchat themselves. There's a generational issue. So you have to explain the advertising product and the ecosystem in which it happens. And then they can't repurpose content from, from other campaigns. They have to build bespoke content, which again needs explanation. So it's a really hard sell. Having said that, um, Snapchat has been the most inspiring and slightly embarrassing experience for me also. And I'll tell you why embarrassing. Uh, in my last role at the Guardian still, working with the product teams, I spent months on trying to optimize article templates to, to increase engagement. Because we all see how on mobile devices, people just you know, stay with you for milliseconds, disappear, don't scroll, and a tiny majority, minority scrolls. Snapchat is the unsung hero of mobile journalism's presentation. That the, the engagement figures, the loyalty, the time spent, the click-through through each story are shocking. And it remains a riddle to me why Snapchat is not talking about it, why they let themselves get caught in the audience growth story, which is the one story they can't win. So there's, there's really a lot to learn from, from that type of storytelling that doesn't force you to scroll, but it doesn't translate into ad sales. We use it to learn, and it has been just fantastic for us to see that in, in Paris we can attract four and a half million super engaged uh, uh, readers, 70% uh, under the age of 24 to a brand like Vogue. So we use it for learning. And yes, we have launched just a Spanish edition now as well. But you're able to make more money in most markets on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Then on Snapchat. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. OK. I think yeah, I have a question. I would like to go back for a second for what you said about sustainability and fast fashion. And in like traditional fashion plus editorial fashion magazines and fashion brands, they're part of this PR media complex that are perpetuating demand building. And you still play that role to the great extent because you every season and in like pre-season and post-season and pre-fall and you know, the cycle has up and you largely still play a big role in fast fashion imitating the demand. Do you think like now that we have these redistribution markets and rental markets and all of that, I'm just thinking how do you see you still being in business and not creating that demand? Because that's where the change is going to happen, not necessarily on the supply side, but on demand side when it doesn't become cool to buy new things every two days. Is Marie Kondo a threat? Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you for the context. So um, we do occasionally write about the, the depops and rent the runway and these kinds of services, of course. But um, 
Huh, how can I put it? I knew a man who was a pioneer in American environmentalism, really one of the key people in launching green movements in the US. And one day, he joined the board of America's largest supermarket chain, the one with the big W and the white letters and blue background. And all his friends uh, uh, dis, you know, disowned him, said, you're no longer one of ours. You're a complete sellout. Uh, and I th thought that too at the time, to be honest. And he said, if I get that company to buy different light bulbs, to stock different light bulbs, I will have done more than all of you together in your entire lifetime. And that's how I look at that question. Of course it is a conflict, but instead of walking away, I rather speak with our editors about how to add that thread into the conversation. And as you know, we write a lot about designers and labels who look into new materials. It's so, the supply side, but it's still the demand side. You need to change the demand side. It has to stop being cool to buy a t-shirt, as I said, every two days. Of course, it's important to have a transparent value to a supply chain, 100%. But at the same time, it's shaping the demand of consumers. Yes, but I don't really see us on, on the side of promoting fast fashion. I mean, you could argue that, that fashion and then at the upper extreme haute couture is the, is the mirror opposite of that. Is these are pieces people keep for a lifetime and hand on to the next generation or put them in museums. Right, but then next season there is something else. That's true, but uh, I, I, you know, I can't defend it, but what I can argue for is to change at least the production and to change the awareness and celebrating craftsmanship and celebrating iconic pieces, I think, is one way of getting there. And of course, we're looking into the issue also with our colleges, where demand for these kinds of courses and classes is going up and, and the type of conferences we run. OK, I think we have time for one more. Yeah? OK, one more. Final question? Yes. I'm going to Davos for that very issue. You know, I could, of course, meet the platform companies and do the usual tour, but I'm mostly meeting NGOs that work on that intersection of textile, fashion, and climate change. That's the only topic I'm, I'm looking into while I'm there. Because I need to learn about it. You know, it's, it's, I want to be very careful talking about it. That tweet was more an apology to all the people I engaged with, fought with, attacked. <laughs> over Brexit, why I suddenly fall silent. It wasn't programmatically to announce that I'm not a climate change expert. But, but there is an element to learning in public and saying, this is something I'm learning already. It makes people come to me, which is wonderful, and how social media uh, works. OK, Wolfgang, we'll let you get to Davos. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.